pleased to welcome you to today's program, Developments Under the Endangered Species Act, What Organizations Need to Know. Before I turn the presentation over to our speakers, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Please type your question into the Q&A widget open on the left-hand side of your screen. We will respond to written questions at the end of the program, time permitting. If you experience technical difficulties during the presentation, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking the help widget below the presentation window. Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference. If you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please send an email to ellikemeter at ekemeter at foley.com. To be eligible for CLE, you will need to log into the ON24 session and answer a polling question during the program. Please note certificates of attendance will be distributed to eligible participants approximately eight weeks after the web conference via email. As a final note, those seeking Kansas, New York, or New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form in addition to the polling question that will appear during the program. A code will be announced during the presentation. Please email the form and the code to Ellie Kemeter immediately following the program. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Tom Maurer who will introduce today's speakers. Hello, uh, I am chair of the Foley and Lardner Environmental Practice Group um, in the Orlando office. It's my pleasure today to inter just introduce the speakers. I've got an easy job today, and it's a, it's a good presentation about an important topic. Uh, Amanda Beggs is, will speak first. She's an associate in our Milwaukee office. She divides her time between conducting environmental and permitting due diligence and transactions and aiding environmental compliance counseling related to a number of environmental laws, including Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Superfund, RICRA, and, of course, the Endangered Species Act. Sarah Slack is a senior counsel in our Madison office. Uh, she is also a member of the California Bar and practices uh, across the country. Uh, she divides her time between remediation development work, environmental compliance counseling, uh, all of the major environmental acts, uh, and the Endangered Species Act, as well as citizen suit litigation, settlement strategies, cost recovery, insurance coverage, and indemnity disputes. Dennis Cardoza is a public affairs director of, and co-chair of the Federal Public Affairs Practice and chair of the California Public Affairs Practice of Foley and Lardner. He advises a broad range of clients on legislative, regulatory, and public policy and advocacy matters and has extensive policy experience with respect to water resources. Uh, prior to joining Foley, Mr. Cardoza served five terms in the U.S. House of Representatives from California's 18th District. Uh, so let's get right to the program, and Amanda will start us off. Uh, thanks, Tom, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to jump right in here with a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today in uh, this presentation. Uh, first, we'll just have a brief background on the Endangered Species Act. Uh, then we'll jump to some examples of Endangered Species Act impacts and project development. And then finally, we'll discuss some new regulations and policies under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and for purposes of my portion of this presentation, uh, just a brief overview here, I'm going to be discussing a brief history of the Endangered Species Act, some key definitions and applications, um, and then some key provisions. Um, before I touch on the history, though, I do want to note at the outset that while for purposes of this presentation we're focusing on the Federal Endangered Species Act, several states have their own species law, um, and that's something to just be aware of at the outset. But for purposes of the history of the Federal Endangered Species Act, there were several laws um, related to species issues that came before it. Um, and the first is under the Commerce Clause, which is the Lacey Act, which prohibits inter interstate trade in illegally obtained wildlife. And then there were several acts um, under the Treaty Power, international acts, um, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, which pro prohibits the taking of endangered, or excuse me, migratory birds. Um, which has had several implica implications in projects today. There's also uh, several conven international conventions that were the precursors to the Endangered Species Act as we know it today, which was an en enacted in 1973. Um, the purpose of that act is to provide a program for the conservation of such endangered species and threatened species and to take such steps as may be appropriate to achieve the purposes of the treaties and conventions. So those international treaties really were the, the foundations for the act as we know it today. Um, jumping to some key definitions and applications that are important to know when looking at the Endangered Species Act, 
first, the species that are covered are really any member of the plant or animal kingdom. So any species, subspecies, or distinct population seg segment of certain vertebrate fish or wildlife. In terms of the agencies involved, um, the primary agency is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but the National Marine Fisheries Service is also uh, tasked with um, implementing the Act for Endangered and Threatened Marine Species. The term conservation is one that is used throughout the Act in, in many places, and it means to bring a species to a point where it's no longer required to be listed on the Endangered Species Act. Um, of course, endangered and threatened are two terms used throughout the Act, and endangered means a species that is in danger of extinct, extinction throughout all or a significant, significant portion of its range, and then threatened is likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future. So that said, how does a species become listed? What, what's the listing process? So there are two primary processes for listing a species. The first is the petition process, and any person, any interested person can petition the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service to list a species. And through the petition process, the agency will review the petition, and then they make a determination as to whether listing the species may be warranted. At that point, if it's a positive determination, meaning they think uh, it warrants listing, there's a one-year review process. And after that year, if the, the agency still thinks the species warrants listing, um, that's when they can issue a proposed rule for listing. The second process is the candidate assessment process. Um, and that's when uh, agency biologists really assess the status of a species and determine whether it's declining and whether it might warrant um, listing, and then that, at that point, they can issue a proposed rule for listing. Um, and looking at the factors that the agencies consider uh, in determining whether to list the species, they look at habitat loss or land conversion of the, the habitat for the particular species, um, overuse by us, uh, disease or predators, whether that's creating um, a declining population, the inadequacy of regulatory mechanism, and then really any other factors that might affect the species' continued existence. So the agency has some discretion there. Um, I did want to note that economic impact is not a specific factor that the agencies look at when uh, listening, but um, they do look at it for critical habitat designations, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, under Section 4, when listing a species, the agencies also must designate critical habitat for a particular species. And what that means is critical habitat includes two, two different things. First, um, it's the specific geographical areas occupied by the species at the time it's listed um, that the agency considers either both um, essential to conservation and may require special management. So where the species already are, and that's also essential to conservation and may require special management. It also includes areas where the species do not currently exist or are not currently occupying if the agency deems that area to be essential to the conservation of the species. So we've sort of already addressed several of these factors for critical habitat designations. The, the habitat area needs to be determinable. It has to be the, essential to the conservation of that species, um, and it may require special management. This last uh, bullet here, areas may be excluded if adverse consequences outweigh the benefits of listing, is something we're going to be discussing um, in greater depth later, but they can be excluded from critical habitat designations. And in this uh, determination, economics are considered. Finally, under Section 4, um, the agency is required to conduct a five-year status review of each listed species. And at that point, they can determine what the status is and whether the species should be uplisted from threatened to endangered or downlisted from endangered to threatened or um, delisted altogether, taken off of the endangered species list altogether. Um, so that's moving us to uh, some more key provisions. We've sort of touched on Section 4 there. Um, Section 7 applies to all federal, to, only to federal activities, um, the federal government, federal agencies. It also applies, though, to federal permittees. So if you've received a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permit or another permit, Section 7 will apply to you. Um, and this section prohibits action that is likely to jeopardize the con continued existence of listed species or that destroys or adversely modifies critical habitat. 
Section 9 of the Endangered Species Act applies to anyone, including private parties on private property, and that section prohibits the taking of endangered species. Um, and taking is broader than just killing an endangered species. It includes harassing, harming, pursuing, shooting, wounding, capturing all sorts of things, or the attempt to do one of those things. So it's actually quite broad in its scope. With that, that gives us the necessary background um, for the last key, key provision I'm going to talk about here briefly in this background, which is Section 10, um, the Incidental Take Permit Provision. Um, and under that provision, the agencies can authorize the take or permit the take of a protected species if it's incidental to the project and it's not the primary purpose of the project. Um, those permits are applied for by the applicant, and in order to apply, they, uh, a ha applicant must submit a habitat conservation plan. Habitat conservation plans include several things. Um, one, the assessment for impacts that might result from the taking. Two, measures to monitor, minimize, and mitigate impacts from the taking. Um, three, alternatives to the taking and why those alternatives weren't pursued. And then four, any additional measures that the agency deems necessary. So they can include many things and um, include several factors. In terms of the mitigation measures that are generally within those habitat conservation plans, um, they can include buffers between the project um, or the development and the habitat in question. It can include preserving existing habitat, um, restoring already or previously destroyed or degraded habitat, or creating new habitat. So with the complexity and um, the several factors often included in habitat conservation plans, um, it, can, it can be a complex process. And for that reason, um, the process of obtaining an incidental take permit can take up to two years or more. With that, I think we've get, gotten a brief background here of the Endangered Species Act, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah who's going to talk about some examples um, in, in project development. Thanks, Amanda. This is Sarah Slack, and I'm going to talk a little bit this afternoon about some examples of how the Endangered Species Act can and has impacted uh, various project developments. So just to kind of put, frame up what I'm going to be talking about, you know, the Endangered Species Act can have real impacts on developments. Uh, the examples I'm going to provide are going to focus on the impacts that have been seen recently in solar and wind developments. And the impacts include increasing development costs. So, you know, during construction, pre-construction, increasing the cost and the time involved. Um, and then in addition, there are also impacts that are, are associated with operational post-construction costs. And finally, to the extent that there may be non-compliance issues, fines and penalties um, can, be, can be significant. So a couple of the recent examples I'm going to touch on today, I'm going to talk about the, uh, an example with the Mojave Desert Tortoise, uh, another example with the Indiana Bat. And I, I have this one listed just because it, there's been a lot of news recently about impacts to golden eagles. Now, that was a non-ESA example, so I, we're not going to talk about it today. The golden eagle is instead protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which Amanda referenced earlier. Um, but there have been a number of recent issues uh, that have come up about that. So with respect to the Mojave Desert Tortoise, it was originally listed in 1989, and there are 12 critical habitat units for that. Um, I note that this is a distinct population segment, the Mojave Desert Tortoise. There are a number of different desert tortoises, and this is a distinct population subset. So the 12 critical habitat units uh, total more than 6 million acres, and they're focused in California, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah. And I, w one interesting factor with the Mojave Desert Tortoise, Amanda referenced earlier the five-year review process that, is go that um, Fish and Wildlife Service goes through with this. And the most recent five-year review for Mojave Desert Tortoise specifically references renewable energy projects. And in that context, they talk, uh, you know, as an example, they talk about transmission lines and how the construction of those can destroy habitat, but then also how the lines can provide perches for uh, birds that may be predators. And then um, it also just increases human activity in an area, it can act, and it can also act as a route for the introduction of invasive species into areas where Mojave Desert tortoises are located, uh, which can adversely impact their habitat. 
So the example I'm going to talk about is the uh, Ivanpah Valley, California uh, Bright Source Energy Solar Farm. So this was a project where the developer did some initial uh, development stage surveys, and you know it's exactly what, what Fish and Wildlife Service wanted them to do. And during that process, they only identified 16 tortoises. Um, but then, as they began to develop, oh, and then then they did go ahead and obtain uh, an incidental take permit or an ITP, which allowed for relocation of about 38 tortoises and then three accidental tortoise deaths per year. What ended up happening though is, in the course of the development, there were many more tortoises that they identified on site than they expected. Uh, during development, they identified and relocated more than 150 tortoises. Uh, there were times when they had up to 100 biologists on site. And ultimately, there was a three-month standstill in development while the developer worked with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service to resolve the issues. Um, ultimately, there were significant project impacts that resulted from having to uh, obtain a reissued ITP. Um, there were millions of dollars that were spent in recovery and relocation. The project re had also had to be redesigned. And as part of that redesign, they had to concede about 10% of the power output to minimize the impact to the tortoise. They had to include an additional 50 miles of fencing that had to be installed. And in addition to that, there was also post-construction monitoring requirements. I'm, I'm sorry, I, not, not just construction, but post-relocation of the tortoise monitoring requirements so that they could confirm that there were no long-term adverse impacts. You know, another recent example is with respect to the Indiana bat. The Indiana bat was originally listed uh, back as endangered back in 1967. And this species has quite a large range. It's predominantly found in Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Missouri, and New York. But there are 15 other states where there have also been uh, Indiana bats have been found. There, uh, the critical habitat for this bat is, is kind of interesting and unique. It's, it's limited to some caves and mines in some certain specific states listed here. Uh, because the, that is where um, the bats spend uh, the time um, when they're most vulnerable. So the example I wanted to talk about is uh, with respect to Greenbrier Briar County, West Virginia, and the Beach Ridge Project, which was originally uh, scheduled to be a 186 megawatt development along 23 miles of the Appalachian Mountain Ridge Line. Now here, the developer conducted some initial surveys, but only conducted summer roosting surveys. The uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had requested some additional surveys, but the developer chose not to conduct any more at that time. And also, the developer chose not to pursue or apply for an incidental take permit at that time. As the developer began to move forward with the project, um, a nonprofit filed a lawsuit to stop construction. And the court um, ultimately held in favor of, of that nonprofit and halted the construction, um, except for some construction that could take place during the winter months pending the companies applying for uh, an incidental take permit. Ultimately, the developer Beach Ridge Energy was able to enter into a settlement with the government. And under the terms of that settlement, uh, they were allowed to proceed with initial construction of a limited number of turbines. Um, but then once those turbines were up, there were also operational restrictions associated with those. So for the, that first round of turbines, for instance, they were only allowed to operate them um, during the day from April 1st until November 15th. And then after some additional studies and an additional approval by the court, they were allowed to do some limited nighttime operation of those turbines um, during that time. They did obtain an ITP in 2013, um, under which, um, amongst other measures, there's going to be long-term monitoring that's required. And it's, it's my understanding also that through that ITP, they were approved to put in some additional uh, turbines if, if they chose. And I just have a quick note here that I wanted to make. You know, this is an example with respect to the Indiana bat, but there are other endangered bat species as well. And in particular, um, one recently listed species, the northern long-eared bat, is, is also has quite a broad territory. And um, it is expected that there may be um, impacts to that species from renewable project development. So before I sign off and turn it over to Dennis, I just thought it would be helpful to provide some some considerations or maybe even some best practices. So with respect to Endangered Species Act in the context of development, survey early and survey often. Um, identifying these potential issues and, and figuring out ways to mitigate or um, possibly even move on from a site may be a, the most efficient way for a project to move forward. Also, I note that a lot of times um, 
companies have an instinct to try to avoid the need to obtain an ITP, and we certainly understand that. ITPs uh, cost money for the surveys and the work that's required to prepare the applications and to coordinate with the agency, and they also take time. So again, we definitely understand that. But we, we, you know, we also would encourage folks to think about whether or not it may be a best practice um, to obtain those ITPs, and especially in the context of thinking about you know, the project development and whether it may be better to spend the time up front versus um, the, you know, the risk of possibly having a project stop in the middle. Um, you know, there are other concerns uh, under the Endangered Species Act, specifically publicity concerns. And then there are certainly cost impacts associated with Endangered Species Act compliance. And finally, a, a note here that I just wanted to touch on is, you know, is green energy green? One of the, one of the uh, criticisms that has come up is that with respect to some of these species issues, renewable projects are considered to be green, but, you know, if there's a, if there's a balancing or an offset um, with respect to species issues, then, then it's just another consideration. And, you know, by making sure to incorporate these considerations in early, you can make sure that, that they don't become an issue. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis. Well, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Amanda and Tom, for your presentations earlier. <clears throat> I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar this afternoon. I've been dealing with the Endangered Species Act for several decades now, and I'm delighted to discuss it here with you today. My presentation will cover the current status of ESA, including several new regulations put forward recently by the Obama administration. However, I need to offer a qualification. Please do not consider my remarks legal advice. I am not a lawyer. Uh, I do speak from my experience as a member of Congress for 10 years and as a sponsor of the last piece of legislation uh, on ESA that passed the House of Representatives, which was um, we have up on the screen, and it was the Threatened and Endangered Species Recovery Act of 2005. That bill, which I sponsored along with former Congressman Richard Pombo, would have comprehensively reformed the ESA and dramatically reshaped critical habitat designation procedures. Unfortunately, the bill was held up by then-Senator Lincoln Chafee in a bid to boost his re-election, which then he subsequently lost anyway. And um, since that time, no comprehensive reform legislation has passed either chamber of Congress. Since 1973, the number of listed and threatened and endangered species has increased dramatically, while the recovery rates remain very low. As of this time last year, 42 years after the enactment, only 29 species had been delisted due to recovery, less than 2% of the 1,600 domestic species listed as threatened or endangered. Last week, the House Oversight Committee held a rare two-day hearing on the delisting process to discuss reform options that would better facilitate species recovery. Legislative discussions involving the Endangered Species Act reform continues in the halls of Congress. At the state level, the Western Governors Association is pursuing ESA reform as one of its two priority issues for 2016 on a bipartisan basis. The law provides for two parallel paths for listing a species. A species may be considered for listing through a public petition or by direct selection either by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, or the National Marine Fisheries Association, otherwise known as NIMFS. The functions of the two agencies are often parallel, and I will use F uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, FWS, and NIMFS, overseen by NOAA, interchangeably throughout the discussion. Oftentimes, species listings are not initiated by the Fish and Wildlife Service, rather uh, litigious environmental organizations often drive listings these days. They file lawsuits on behalf of the species, sometimes for hundreds of species at a time. The agency settles these lawsuits out of court often, and then hundreds of species are added to the candidate species list without any public scrutiny or oversight. Just two suits settled in 2011 required Fish and Wildlife Service to make listing decisions on over 250 species. For each species listed, Fish and Wildlife Service is required by statute to designate species uh, critical habitat within one year, we've heard previously in the conversations today. The critical habitat designation is important. When a federal action is involved, it extends the strong protections of the listed 
plant or animal to that larger habitat, severely restricting productive use of that land. <clears throat> federal involvement includes any federal agency permit, license, or funding connected with the use of the land. If any of those are needed, the acting federal agency must consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service to ensure that, ensure that critical habitat is not destroy, destroyed or adversely modified. That, that term is known as adverse modification. And is contentious in its own right because we, as we will talk more about uh, later in the presentation. There are currently only 744 areas in the United States for which Fish and Wildlife Service has designated a critical habitat. And even then, some species have more than one critical habitat designation. New listings and habitat determinations could result in a doubling or tripling of that critical habitat acreage as the agencies catch up on its statutory requirement to designate habitat for the close to 1,000 additional species who have those listings pending. I'm going to discuss the no a number of regulations impacting critical habitat later on, uh, so I want to give you an example. The loggerhead sea turtle is listed as threatened by Fish and Wildlife Service. It is a, its critical habitat includes nearly 700 miles of beaches from Mississippi to North Carolina. In my experience in working with builders in California, including overseeing the process to build the University of Cali California at Merced, most medium-sized developments require a federal permit of some variety. Let's say a landowner wants to build a condo complex on a southern beach, and in the process, she requires a permit from the agency of the federal government. The odds are that the landholder will also have to go through the burdensome process of providing to Fish and Wildlife Service her that her actions will not destroy or adversely modify loggerhead sea turtle habitat. And that's just one species of the nearly 6,000 listed for habitat in the United States. I want to now switch gears for a moment and talk about uh, the ESA statute specifically. The text that governs our interactions with endangered species. Excluding relatively minor DOD provisions added in 2002, the ESA has not been changed in the past 28 years since it was originally passed. Congress continues to fund the agency, even through the uh, annual appropriations process, even though the law's authorization ran out in 1992. This is important because periodic reauthorizations typically allow Congress to amend laws and exercise regulatory authority over the direction of federal programs. In this case, without reauthorization, Congress has ceded total control of the ESA to the administration. Imagine if the highway bill kept the same authorizing language from 1956. We would have a distinctly different transportation system under that scenario. While conservation practices and our environment have changed dramatically, Congress has not kept up in adjusting the law. In its absence, the administration has increasingly used rulemaking to unilaterally, up, unilaterally update the ESA policy. Just the last two months, four new ESA policies come, have come out of the Obama administration. These new regulatory um, or new agency regulations will, on balance, greatly expand the scope of critical habitat designations redefine activities permitted within critical habitat, alter conservation-based critical habitat exclusions, and overhaul federal mitigation policy. We will discuss three regulations re relating to critical habitat, and if time permits, touch on the fourth, um, on the fourth new mitigation policy. In the Endangered Species Act, critical habitat is a landscape given additional protections because it contains the physical or biological features essential to species survival. In the new policy issued February 5, 2016, Fish and Wildlife Service and, and NOAA stated that they will expand critical habitat areas beyond where a species naturally occurs. The services will preemptively designate critical habitat for areas which the species may occupy in the event of climate change in the future. Remember that map of the loggerhead sea turtle critical habitat that I, expl um, I explained earlier. 
This regulation states that if determined by Fish and Wildlife to be essential for sea turtle conservation, Fish and Wildlife Service could preemptively extend critical habitat from Mississippi not to North Carolina, but all the way to Maryland, Massachusetts, or even Maine, where the loggerhead turtle has never existed. Massachusetts law, uh, landowners in this example would be subject to restrictions of critical habitat now, even though the loggerhead sea turtles may never have existed there. The only limit to the expanse of critical habitat is that Fish and Wildlife Service must find that habitat could in, become essential to the conservation of the species sometime in the foreseeable future. Uh, my opinion is that the ESA has become tantamount to a federal zoning legislation, and these regulations appear to further that end. Indeed, the services state that the ability to, uh, to expand critical habitat is expected to become increasingly important in the, in the coming years. The regulations actively encourage Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA to designate critical habitat outside of a listed species range. The regulations require the Secretary to identify that, quote, need not have the features essential to the conservation of the species, but could develop those features at a time later. This places a large emphasis on projections and climate change models in designating long-term critical habitat projections. So critical habitat designations may ex include economic considerations, the new regulations greatly expand the area eligible to be considered critical habitat. My clients are already experiencing regula regulators that are predisposed to stopping development. In this new policy, will give the, the regula re excuse me, will give the regulators vastly expanded additional powers into zoning authority that has traditionally been reserved to states. Again, any area that a listed species could occupy in the foreseeable future could be designated as critical habitat today. All federal agency actions to include licenses, funding, and ordinary routine permits are subject to Section, 17, Section 7 prohibitions against deconstruction or adverse modification of critical habitat. The definition of that phrase has now changed. The old definition of destruction or adverse modification was invalidated by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in 2004. And just this year, Fish and Wildlife Service finalized the new definition. Even though the new definition is considered more restrictive, um, many environmental groups are still pressing to go further and have criticized the re um, revision uh, that has been made this year by the Obama administration as not going far enough. Together with climate change provisions, the new destruction of adverse modification provides a layer of restriction to landowners, developers, pesticide applicators, and others. Under the new standards for destruction and adverse modification, an action must appreciably diminish the value of critical habitat expressly for the consideration of a listed species. The previous de definition required an action not appreciable dim uh, diminishment in the value of the critical habitat for both the survival and recovery. The administration claims the new definition more closely links an action with the impacts to the species, as opposed to the impacts of the, uh, on the general landscape. Nonetheless, productive use of critical habitat will still be subject to close scrutiny and a high standard uh, for environmental review. The second half of the new definition is likely to become increasingly important as it adds an additional burden to Section 7 consultations. Not only must an action ensure the conservation of the existing landscape features, but also those that may develop in the future. The new definition of destruction and adverse modification includes activities that preclude or significantly delay the development of such features. For example, if cattle grazing on federal lands pose no threat to the current status of critical habitat, but they are found to delay the development of an essential feature, for, ex for instance, brush habitat that ranchers could be forced to curtail his operations. In addition, expanding the geographic area of critical habitat, um, this revi revised definition expands regulatory restrictions on activities within that habitat. The combination will ensure increased lit litigation and is likely to further constrain productive land use. 
The Secretary of the Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA has the authority to exclude areas from critical habitat if the benefits of the exclusions outweigh the benefits of specifying such areas as part of critical habitat. Exclusions to critical habitat can be granted for a wide variety of activities, including productive economic use of land. Today I want to focus on conservation-related exclusions because it highlights um, federalism issues inherent in the Endangered Species Act. For the past several years, federal regulators have consistently undermined state, local, and tribal conservation efforts. Just last week, the, Fiddle, the Fish and Wildlife Service reversed a proposed rule that would have required public listing of petitions to include information from state wildlife agencies in their submissions. By statute, the service has only 90 days, as we mentioned before, to initially consider a species for listing. Having access to that st uh, information from state wildlife agencies would have resulted in a higher quality of determinations given the tight time frame. However, after proposing the requirement, the Obama administration stripped it out of the final rule, depriving those closest to the species, those at the state and local level, a voice in the decision-making process for that species. Environmental groups lobbied against the inclusion of state and local information because the um, state and local governments often have data that counter the claims made by listing proponents, usually those same environmental groups. Once a species critical habitat is established, the Fish and Wildlife Service is free to ex determine exclusions to um, designated critical habitat at agency's discretion. These exclusions remove the restrictive regulations of critical habitat from a specific area. Exclusions can make, be made for economic, national security, or conservation considerations. Exclusions are especially important to conservation as they allow conservation efforts to active, conservationists to actively manage uh, the landscape for the benefit of the species. Without exclusions from critical habitat designations, many land conservation efforts in critical habitat areas would be in violation of the ESA and subject to har harsh penalties. For example, if a farmer um, has a, a species on his property, uh, he can set aside an land and, and operate that um, property in a way, but it, they oftentimes won't participate in the program if uh, in the normal course of farming activities, it might run over or or t uh, take a species. They won't uh, they won't try and foster the habitat because there's uh, additional um, ramifications to them and and uh, threat to them. So they won't participate in the program. In an agency's in the agency's new regulation, the Fish and Wildlife Service sets a different standard for exclusions to critical habitat based on whether a conservation measure is federally approved. The services anticipate consistently excluding federally permitted conservation agreements, um, and that is consistent with the ESA. Fish and Wildlife intends to always remove the restrictions from critical habitat areas subject to a federally permitted habitat conservation plans, thus trying to promote those larger plans. State, local, and private conservation measures may not be excluded from the kit, uh, critical habitat, however. The new policy requires only the Fish and Wildlife Service consider non-federal non conservation efforts in determining critical habitat. This policy has the practical impact, as I mentioned before with the farmer example, of undermining state, local, and private voluntary conservation efforts. I want to... So oh, we, uh, we need to pause right here and, and turn it over to our moderator to make an announcement. Yes, thank you, Dennis. Um, so at this time, I'm going to read the CLE code for this program. So if you're in need of CLE today, please enter this five-digit code into the poll question on the screen after it's announced and press the Submit button. So the code is SPV57. Again, that's the letter S as in Sam, the letter P as in Paul, the letter V as in Victor, the number five, and the number seven, SPV57. Again, if you are seeking CLE credit for this session, please complete the polling question by entering the code that was just announced. The polling question will remain open for the next few moments, so please do this now.
Um, and then just a, another reminder for those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit, in addition to the polling question, you will need to complete the attorney affirmation form and return it immediately following the program. A copy of the form can be found in the resource list widget. And as a reminder, certificates of attendance will be distributed approximately eight weeks after the web conference via email. Okay. So this time, please go ahead, Dennis. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, this next section is particularly important. Um, it, and I want to mention as well that mitigation will uh, become vitally important as our population grows and climate change progresses. Uh, mitigation can facilitate both economic growth and species conservation. I believe we should practice more of it, and our federal policies should encourage it. Unfortunately, the recent Obama administration regulations fall short of incentivizing mitigation and may make mitigation more diff difficult, as I will explain now. If an, if an activity impacts sensitive land, the law states that the entity must mitigate for the impact by reducing the impact or providing for the perpetual care of the land with similar features. In the case of endangered species, this may be accomplished by protecting an adjacent parcel of land occupied by the same listed species. This example is, is what we typically refer to as mitigation. In the administration's new policy is called compensatory mitigation and compensation for the productive use of sensitive land by providing for a long-term conservation of a separate tract of similar land. Compensatory mitigation is not encouraged by the services and is considered the last type of mitigation recognized or encouraged by the Fish and Wildlife Service. More specific guidance will follow in the coming months. The forthcoming guidance will establish best practices for applying for service-wide mitigation policies to endangered species. The mitigation policy that has been announced includes several important provisions that I will discuss individually in the next few slides. Instead of promoting alternative mitigation opportunities, the mitigation hierarchy established under the new rule states that applicants must seek alternatives to avoid and or minimize adverse impacts before pursuing compensatory mitigation. In essence, the preferred agency position is for humans to move their projects instead of moving the species. The Fish and, Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service mitigation policy states that a compensatory mitigation may be pursued only in limited circumstances for listed and endangered species. In the new policy, Fish and Wildlife and NOAA will also uh, seek to maximize returns for compensatory mitigation. Though the minimum goal of mitigation is still to maintain the current status of affected resources, the policy now states that the services will seek a net gain where possible. The previous standard of no net loss has been replaced by the regulatory encouragement to extract the highest possible price to mitigate for uh, economic activity. The way I read it, if you want to build on land that requires mitigation, Fish and Wildlife Service now plans to ask for an extra pound of flesh in addition to the equal compensation of that land because there is no limit to how large the net gain that the service uh, will seek uh, this leaves proponents of mitigation uncertain as to the ultimate cost of those efforts. Entities may be less likely to get, engage in any activity that will impact critical habitat, that will stimulate economic growth and fund long-term, uh, and, and in fact will not uh, fund long-term species conservation, as we have seen with mitigation banks in the past. The mitigation policy may further disincentivize mitigation by shifting um, the target for habitat valuation. In pursuing mitigation, there must be a standard by which habitat is valued to provide a basis for, level, for the level of mitigation that must occur. Fish and Wildlife and NOAA evaluate each individual mitigation proposal based on each habitat scarcity, species suitability, and conservation value. In each instance of mitigation, the value of the mitigated land to the affected species must exceed or equal the value of the land impacted on the action, that is in the new rules. 
consistent with the mitigation hierarchy, the services consider compensatory mitigation off limits for the most high value land. If it's deemed lower value for the species, Fish and Wildlife and NOAA will evaluate whether compensatory mitigation is on net benefit standard uh, and meets the net benefit standard. Mitigation will only proceed if Fish and Wildlife finds that the conservation value of mitigated land exceeds or at the very least equals the value of impacted land. Uh, my, my feeling here is that almost always they will move uh, in the most conservative direction in the benefit of the species and uh, they will ask you to exceed um, the value of the impacted land. In another major shift in mitigation policy, there is a transition to the landscape level approach, which is the desire to build regional conservation plans and attempt to incorporate local instances of mitigation into much larger habitat um, regions. The goal of the landscape level approach is to better coordinate conservation efforts within state and local governments and private organizations. As I discussed earlier, Fish and Wildlife Services pre previously undermined, in my opinion, state and local and private conservation efforts. However, here they've, they've changed the model a little bit. The landscape level approach to mitigation may direct mitigation efforts to predetermined locations and may reduce flexibility for proponents in determining where their mitigation efforts might be able to take place. In the assessing a landscape level approach, climate change will also come into play. As scientists model the region's impact of climate change, Fish and Wildlife Service will begin incorporating those projected impacts into the scope and scale of proposed mitigation efforts, likely increasing the cost of mitigation to applicants. The concept of mitigation banking has been an essential tool to providing flexibility and access to mitigation efforts. It is the sale of credits in established nonprofit or for profit managed conservation areas that proponents may buy into to mitigate for a planned uh, action. The new policy requires a unique analysis of the value of the planned habitat disruptions for each individual permit. It expressly forbids the standard measurement of ha habitat impact as conservation costs or a ratio of habitat acreage. No longer can you do just two acres to any one acre of land you're destroying, but you have to have the quality of those acres judged in both circumstances. Again, many feel this creates uncertainty for the action proponents and erodes the incentive to participate in, in habitat conservation. If mitigating for an impact to sea turtles on 40 acres of shoreline uh, landowners now do not know at the outset whether Fish and Wildlife Service will require 40, 400, or 4,000 acres of set aside in compensation. Each landscape will be judged individually and again subject to the net gain standard. So to summarize, the agencies are calling for a less certain process of determining outcomes and lending themselves even more discretion and could take even more aggressive postures in assessing mitigation efforts. The last significant piece of mitigation policy is a requirement that mitigation activities take place before an action occurs, instead of concurrently as a project is being built. Currently, mitigation allows, is allowed in stages and given, uh, given assurances that the mitigation will increase as the project progresses. That is generally no longer permitted under the new regulations. This will likely result in millions of dollars in upfront costs for mitigation proponents and possibly years before the return on the activity can be realized. There is a concern that the requirement for Fish and Wildlife Service to seek costly advanced mitigation will preclude small entities from even engaging in mitigation efforts at all, and so their pr uh, permits will likely just be denied. This is an unnecessary impediment, in my opinion, to an effective and non-intrusive way to provide for perpetual conservation for listing species. Where I come from in Central Cal uh, the Central Valley of California, we are intimately familiar with the Endangered Species Act. Biological opinions occur to the Act, current, uh, the, uh, biological opinions 
pursuant to the act, currently deprive cities, towns, and farmers of much-needed water throughout California. In the region that produces half the fruits and vegetables in the, in the U.S., hundreds of thousands of acres are lying fallow to protect endangered Delta smelt, steelhead, and Chinook salmon hundreds of miles away. New climate change rules will likely exacerbate these tensions and expand the far-reaching impacts of the Endangered Species Act across the country. The new Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA critical habitat designation policy has the potential to dra drastically expand the geographic footprint of critical habitat, allowing Fish and Wildlife Service to designate critical habitat for areas and species that they may occupy in the event of climate change greatly expands the agency's authority. Uh, the revision definition of, the of destruction or adverse modification also further expands the agency's authority. It may halt otherwise acceptable activities that do not impact critical ha habitat areas as it exists now, but are determined to harm features that may develop many, many years out in the foreseeable future. Taken together, the new net gain standard, mitigation hierarchy, habitat valuation model, climate change considerations, mitigation banking standards, and advanced mitigation requirements all vastly contribute to a new mitigation policy that is much more complex and much more costly. These changes will continue to expand the influence of the Endangered Species Act far beyond the intentions of those who drafted the legislation originally. Its near unanimous passage has been followed by decades of conflict, expanded authority through litigation and settlements, all while reforms have continued to languish in Congress. I know this has gone very fast and I've covered a lot of material. Foley's public policy team and the environmental law practice have extensive experience in these matters. Uh, we are more than happy to discuss any part of this presentation with you and answer any questions that you may have. I, uh, again, thank you for sharing your afternoon with us, and I turn this back over to Tom to wrap up the presentation with the question and answer section. Thanks, Dennis. Um, just um, uh, only one question that I, I, that I have here, um, which is um, given the polarization in Congress and the gridlock that you see uh, in the current um, politics in Congress. Um, is there any chance for meaningful reform or changes to uh, public policy in the endangered species area? Well, we actually think so. Uh, I uh, convened a conference with uh, the Western Growers Association, and we brought together about 10 interest groups um, that wanted to see if we couldn't work with Congress to uh, uh, bring about some resolution and, and propose some moderate reforms that would actually both help the species and, and potentially help businesses that are, are trying to um, uh, locate in the areas that uh, um, they, they need for expansion. And uh, we came up with a set of goals and priorities that we think might very well uh, lend itself to a bipartisan solution. I, I don't see that in this session of Congress, but I do think that in the future, um, as these thousand new species get critical habitat designations throughout the country, uh, there there is an opportunity for members of Congress to uh, address these as, as more citizens are impacted and become concerned that their land is being taken with them uh, without them even really knowing that it was happening. So uh, I think, Tom, that there will be a, a climate in the future. Uh, certainly all of us are concerned about making sure that we don't uh, further endanger threatened uh, species. But at the same time, uh, we really do need common sense to prevail so that we can allow the, the best possible habitat uh, conservation efforts to go forward. And as the example I listed with the farmer who might be um, there, one of the, the, the species that we had a real problem with in California was kangaroo rat. Uh, farmers were willing to set aside habitat, but if they killed one in the process of, of their farming operation, they certainly didn't want to be put in a federal prison for trying to help foster more kangaroo rats to survive. Um, that's the kind of thing where the Endangered Species Act really um, acts uh, with blunt force and doesn't uh, do the best job in, 
and trying to foster a relationship that would allow for conservation of the species. I think there's some real realization of that in Congress, Tom, and I think that as the years proceed, we may be able to get rational folks together on some of these issues. Well, great. That's the that's the only question that that I have here. So, uh, with that, I'll I'll turn it back over to Ellie for some closing housekeeping comments. Thank you so much, Tom. So, if you do have any questions after the program, uh, we invite you to contact any of today's speakers. Um, again, if you have additional questions or would like just more information on their particular topics, um, please feel free to contact them using the contact information on the screen. Um, and then. That wraps up our web conference today. So just as a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will be available on Foley's website in the next few days. If you have questions regarding CLE for this program, please contact Ellie Kemeter at ekemeter at foley.com. And as a reminder, CLE processing takes approximately eight weeks and eligible participants will receive their certificate of attendance via email. And finally, at the conclusion of this program, a questionnaire will appear. Please take a minute or two to give us your feedback about the presentation today. It, it really is important to us to know your thoughts and helps us shape our programs going forward. Thank you again for your participation.